So, um, welcome to the second session of the dialogue series, The Healing Arts, Encounters in Arts and Medicine, here at the Berlin University of the Arts, in collaboration with the International Society for Arts and Medicine and the Network Art and Medicine at the Charité Medical Center in Berlin. So, with a series of um, discursive encounters, um, it's our special intention to break down barriers and to create alliances between the arts, between science, and between medicine or the medical sciences. And thereby we call upon all participants, that's not only our guests, but literally you online and here in persona, to collaborate at the intersections of very diverse backgrounds and knowledges and to think and learn together beyond textbook knowledge, beyond standard protocol about um, how art and science and medicine are contemporary and complementary forms of knowledge production that can learn from one another. And we will um, start with two distinguished guests today, and that is uh, to quickly introduce Professor Dr. Stefan Willig and Ayumi Paul. The setup will be as followed. Um, each of them will give a short presentation about 15 minutes before we kind of enter a moderated dialogue, before you can also ask questions. I will start by introducing you, Stefan. Um, so Professor Dr. Stefan Willig um, studied medicine in Berlin, in Munich, and in New York. And before that, actually, he studied violin, chamber music, and conducting in Stuttgart. Uh, you also have a Master of Public Health from Harvard University and a Master of Business Administration. But since 1995, so for a very long time, uh, Stefan has been the professor and director of the Institute of Social Medicine, Epidemiology and Health Economics at the Charité Universitätsmedizin in Berlin. And what's very interesting in your biography is that from 2012 to 2014, Stefan was the president of the Conservatory of Music, the Heinz Eisler Musikschule here in Berlin. He's also the founder and the music director of the world's Doctor's Orchestra, and he's the president of the International Society for Arts and Medicine. So, a warm applause for Stefan Willig, please. Thank you for that very kind introduction and invitation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to spend 15 minutes to tell you why I think medicine and the arts should start a relationship, a significant relationship. I will obviously take the medical perspective. However, I would like to start with a little bit of music. One of the nicest melodies of classical music, and uh, many people will love that music. Others may like jazz or pop music or whatever, and no doubt it's very nice to have that kind of music. However, is it also helpful health-wise? Can it heal? Can it improve not only your well-being, 
but even your health. And there's a group in Milano that was interested in exactly the question, what does this melody cause in the recipients? So they used the slow movement of Beethoven Ninth Symphony and did physiologic investigation with subjects. And they checked, for example, the rate of respiration. And they could see that the respiration very closely reflects the dynamic changes in the music. So here at the lower panel, they came up with a very close correlation between musical changes and respiratory changes. Similarly, there are many other investigations looking at physiological effects of music, and music can affect heart rate, breathing rate, muscular tonus, even hormonal changes, and even organ function. That's not new. This has been known for a long time. In fact, it started thousands of years ago with King Saul here on the right side and David playing for King Saul. And you can read in the Old Testament, whenever the evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul, David took his harp and played. And then Saul was relieved and felt better, for the evil spirit departed from him. Obviously, some bouts of depression in King Saul and some healing effects of listening to music. Now, in the ancient world, in the ancient Greek world, Pythagoras talked about the regulation of chaotic inner life through means of music. Plato referred to healing as re-establishing harmony. And Aristotle even talked about musical catharsis. And the god Apollo combined both fields. He was god in charge of healing, health, medicine, and also in charge of the arts. In the Middle Ages, music was an essential part in medical school. It was one of seven obligatory fields to be studied. Music, in addition, was used as therapy for various diseases from Arabic hospitals, it's known that specific pieces of music, specific melodies were used for specific disorders. 18th, 19th century was the beginning of what we would call modern medicine. Body and soul were separated, was a dualism, music therapy lost in its importance and medicine was fundamentally changed and based on natural scientific basis. However, at least music therapy continued to play a certain role, particularly in psychiatric disorders. And it was only like 50 years ago, 50, 60 years, where something like a renaissance of art therapy can slowly be observed in medicine. One of the trigger were the so-called Mozart effect studies. What was that? That was a group in California, University of California, Irvine, they did intelligence tests with students. And they did a control group that received no music before and an intervention group that listened to Mozart right before the intelligence test. And the latter group performed better in the intelligence test. So this was heavily spread this news all over the world with the, in the media with the obvious question, should we expose all our kids to Mozart? to just improve their intelligence and their performance. Scientifically, it was not that sound, could actually never be reproduced, but these studies are out there. Then imaging techniques. In medicine, we have a lot of imaging techniques now. Um, for example, here, the brain of professional musicians, we can visualize what's going on when you listen to music or when you play music. You can listen which areas of the brain are being activated. So we learn a lot about music perception and music making, actually. What are the clinical effects of art therapy? Let's start with music. There's at least 1,000 solid scientific publications. Most look at diseases from the cardiovascular area, psychiatric, neurodegenerative, neonatal disease, or pain. 
And many of those studies show significant effects. I'll just give you a few examples. Now the question is, are we, are we there? Have we solved the problem? Should music be reimbursed by health insurance? If you go to the concert hall, should you get paid for by your health insurance company or not? Now, neonatology, we are talking about the departments where the very early premature born babies, uh, 500, 600, 700 gram babies, there are several studies on looking at music therapy in exactly that setting. And actually at the Charité, we do have a neonatology unit where a music therapist is active. Now we would obviously not go with big percussion or trombone playing here. You do it with very soft instruments. However, the results are quite amazing. There are significant positive effects on heart rate, breathing rate, oxygen saturation, weight gain, frequency of breastfeeding, duration of hospital stay. Remarkable. Anxiety, particular intervention-related anxiety before surgery. Again, there are several studies that show that music can have a beneficial effect, at least in terms of psychological parameters. There was no clear effect in terms of physiological parameters. And I give you the third example. That's well-known music therapy for patients with depression as one of the most prominent disorders worldwide. Again, there have been several studies, and if you put all these studies together and look at the results, there's clear advantages for patients treated with music therapy in addition to standard therapy. In my own institute, Ronja Joschko, our co-worker, um, over the last two years collected all studies that had ever been published looking whether art, visual art therapy, act, active visual art therapy has an effect or not. Now, there are 70 studies that have been published worldwide on visual art therapy, about half of them in mental health, some others in neurology, some others in prevention. What are the results? On the left side, this is the number of those 70 studies that show that the patients treated with visual art therapy perform better compared to the control group. In the middle, there's at least a tendency towards a better outcome. And on the right side, those did not perform better. Now, the drawback of these studies is that the study quality is quite limited. Many studies were done with only few participants, or the control setting was not clear. And the really good studies here, seen in green, big, large, very solid scientific studies, are relatively few. So we don't have a clear picture yet as to whether it's truly recommendable for certain disorders. However, the tendency looks promising. Let's put this together. In medicine, we usually think that health is determined by four different parameters. All of you in the room, your health is determined by genes and biology, whatever you get from your family, by psychosocial factors, whether you're happy or not, whether you live alone or not, then by a healthcare system, if you have a disorder, whether you're treated adequately or not, and by environment, climate, noise, pollution, water quality, you name it. How could art possibly interact with those periods? Now, the arts, if you think about it, the arts can have direct so psychosocial factors, well-being. The arts clearly can be used in the healthcare system. That's what I just showed you in terms of arts therapy. And the arts, of course, in terms of environment, accompanies us all the time. Already when we are born, our mothers will sing to us. When we go shopping, there will be, there will be uh, plenty of music. When we go to funerals or weddings, there will be music. Music is just a, a regular company throughout life. Now, at the Charité, we recently founded a network on arts and medicine. 
first of all, that the people that are involved in that activity start to know each other. The Charité has about 20,000 co-workers, so usually we don't really know what we do, but here we try to gather people. We want to get cooperation partners and invite everybody in Berlin and beyond Berlin, including artists, to also join this network. We want to have artistic offers for patients, co-workers, students. We seek cooperation regional with academic institutions, art institutions, cultural institutions, Berlin University Alliance, academies of sciences and arts, and so on. And we want to participate in architectural developments. I'll just give you a brief example at the end. Obviously, dialogue is needed with society, media, politics, and we hope that the Charité will start to become a center of excellence for that. In terms of clinical care, we try to see who is doing what. We want to have prospective documentation that we can understand what's going on. We want to develop guidelines, quality management, and last, not least, address reimbursement issues. Try to get reimbursed. Now, research-wise, the combination between arts and therapy, you could, uh, you could determine the effectiveness of art therapy, mechanisms of action, public health effects, artistic transformation, and architectural issues, and all together, hopefully, in a few years, we can develop larger special research areas. In terms of teaching, we have already, since several years, a seminar on arts and medicine at the Charité. Then I'm very, very happy that Lucas established this lecture series, Healing Arts, Encounters in Arts and Medicine, and we will foster artistic activities of students. Let me show you an architectural example. That is a typical floor in very many hospitals. When they do radiotherapy, they do usually do it underground. So that's exactly how it looks like in many radiotherapy units. This is an example from Angers, France. And many co-workers spend their entire professional life here. Nursing staff, technical staff, doctors. And many patients spend the last weeks and months of their life in that environment. And this hospital started an artistic transformation done by Philippe Leduc, an art and French artist. For one year, he transformed exactly the same space in dialogue with the co-workers, in dialogue with the patients, and that's what he came up with. That's exactly how the same hospital, the same um, premises looks today. Unfortunately, this was not accompanied by research to evaluate the effect, but it's hard not to imagine that people would feel much better with that kind of uh, environment. Last but not least, we also founded an International Society for Arts and Medicine um, with a very similar goal like this network. We'll have the first Congress here next September in Berlin together with an International Association of Music and Medicine that has been around already for 10 years. And you are all more than invited to join there and experience what kind of dialogue discussion is possible. We clearly want to address all different arts, music, visual performing arts, dance, literature, architecture. We still seek for the best location. We hope that we will get this. This is currently still being used in Berlin, but perhaps in September we get it. No, we'll be at, the, at a beautiful venue at the Charité. And last not least, Lucas referred already to the risks of arts. There's not only benefits, there's also risks involved. This is the list of conductors that died doing their conducting activity. <laughs> it is about 10 conductors. You see the year they died, and on the right side, you see what they conducted when they died. <laughs> Wagner, Tristan, and Isolde. It's pretty high up. Mahler is dangerous, too. <laughs> Maris Janssons is in parentheses because he died in 1996, but was resuscitated in time. There was a doctor in the audience, and within a few minutes, he was resuscitated. 
and had another 20 productive years until he died about two or three years ago. Most recently is Stefan Soltisch, when he died, when he conducted Schweigsame Frau by Richard Strauss. Thank you very much. So, um, while you are quickly helping me with the other presentation, thank you so much, uh, Stefan. Actually, um, I would like to start with an anecdote, because in many ways, the um, one of the reasons why we're here today in doing this is because we shared a cab ride about one and a half years ago, um, where we had to ride for an hour and we're talking and talking and it, it, it's kind of the was the initial moment uh, for, for a lot of things to um, you know take shape and now we come to Ayumi so Ayumi um, we met many years ago and I'm extremely thrilled I've always waited for the moment to invite you into one of my programs or something that I'm doing here and today uh, that day has come so you studied classical violin and but today you work as a composer and as an interdisciplinary artist. Um, you actively engage a form of, I would call it, deep listening. Um, and the non-linearity of time, as you call it. And your projects show also how sound and perception influence and how we relate to one another in an often shared as new languages, as rituals, as heightened sensitivities which can then also instantly be applied to everyday life. And uh, last year, in 2022, as the artist in residence at the Martin Gropius Bau, you transformed the museum into a place of continuous song. So, um, please a warm applause for Yumi Paul. <laughs> and the stage, the stage is yours. Um, thank you very much for inviting me and hello everyone. I'm very, very happy to, to see you here, to hear you, to smell you, to um, be here with you together. And I would like to start my presentation with a practice. So I would like to invite you to close your eyes. and to take a moment to say hello to your breath, like welcoming a really good friend, without any judgment, maybe the way we would walk into a beautiful forest and just for a moment enjoy the green around us. Inhale through your nose. And exhale through your nose. See if you can slide into a sensation of drinking in the air through your nose. Mm. And then exhale through the nose. And then begin to breathe just a bit slower than you would usually do. Just a little bit slower because it's so pleasurable to breathe in. And breathe out. Imagine yourself as a ball and continue to breathe a bit slower. And then imagine how this ball turns into a listening device. All the antennas move outwards and while you are breathing, 
you are listening into the space that is around you. First, this room that we share. Listen to the hearts that are beating in this room and then expand into all directions. Left, right, up, down, into all directions. Hear all the hearts that are beating. And hear all the hearts that were beating in the past, that are going to beat in the future. Breathing in through your nose, breathing out through your nose. and then return to the sound of your own heart. That is beating together with all the other hearts. <coughs> you are still a ball. And now remember that while we are all sitting here in this room, we are also all together hanging upside down from this planet. And as a ball, breathing in, breathing out, with your heartbeat that is participating in beating with all the other heartbeats, imagine a sound Imagine that you are filling up your ball with a sound. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to sing, so just to warn you already, keep breathing slowly, inhale through your nose, exhale through your nose. You can begin to sense into whether your sound wants to be whistled, hummed, or sung. And now please take a deep inhale through your nose and go. Thank you very, very much. Did anyone feel that this sound, this chord, was without structure? Or very dissonant and very, very unbearable to listen to? Did anyone compose this sound? How did you feel while sounding this sound. I'm going to come back to the quality of singing and what I do with it in my practice. I'm going to share a few projects in order to um, give you an um, example of how I try to expand, deepen the context within which I listen to music, within which I am music. What is a concert? Concert, the word concert, concenere, means to come together. Who is coming together? Is it a few hundred people who paid quite a lot of money to enter the concert hall? Who is coming together? What could a concert also be? Are there maybe already a lot, a lot of concerts that we just forgot to hear or 
forgot to remember that they exist. Um, in the following video work that I'm going to show you an excerpt of, that I call Earth Rhythms, the parameters of with what and whom I want to be in concert with is the rotation of the Earth. In this work, the rotation of the Earth is the rhythm to which I attune. I did this practice many, many times in different locations and I continue to do so. In this specific video, I am in uh, Mexico and I was told that I should not click on the link but do something else which I now cannot find anymore. So, how do we perceive the rotation of Earth? Are we now perceiving that we are hanging from Earth? Are we perceiving that we are swirling around? I forgot how fast. It is tremendously fast. There is one aspect that gives us a hint of the rotation, which is the changing light. So I play in this project Earth Rhythms with the rotation of the Earth and I can kind of frame it into a video work, for example, because the light is changing and it slowly, slowly becomes darker. I'm listening, I'm improvising with the sounds of Earth rotating into the evening. This is already almost in the middle of this video. It starts when it's still very, very light and towards the end of the video you will only see darkness. You will not see me anymore but you will continue to hear the sound. And the change of the light happens so gradually that somehow our senses of observing the light and also of listening to the sounds become very, very fine-tuned. project that is that I named We Are We. I started it um, in 2018. Um, it was first commissioned by the National Gallery in Singapore um, as a performance compositional project and um, I started to tune into the city of Singapore and just do some follow my intuition basically. Um, in order to see what would tickle my curiosity to then follow with research. I will shorten um, the process now a little bit. What I then ended up doing was that I asked about 60 women who are present in my life to gift me a piece of fabric that is connected to a story for them. And I stitched all those pieces of fabric together into one dress that you can see here, front and back. And here are some of their stories. When I had to choose some of them today, it was a bit um, difficult for me to make choices, so I might go um, just pick a few. When you asked me to give you a piece of fabric, I thought about what kind of experience I wanted to share with you and what kind of experience do we give to other people. The first thing that came to my mind was that I did not want to share any of my sorrows but wanted to give you something that was not heavy and that felt like bright laughter. I went through my memories and chose a neck scarf which I was wearing on the day of my wedding when I was 19 years old. On that day I remember thinking of the world and seeing it as a fun light and sparkles. 
like bubblegum and wildness and funfair rides, that day I loved and laughed so much. Even though I separated from my husband, we remained incredibly close friends. Our relationship was the first time that I consciously chose someone to be part of my family without blood ties. I tried to keep in me some of that brightness and warmth and bubbly feeling I had that day. It gets difficult sometimes to stay light because life can add a lot of weight if one is not careful, but this piece of fabric has always been a good reminder for me to shed the weight and look for happiness, both for myself and for those I love. And um, I don't know if you can see my, ah yeah, you can see my pointer. So that's, for example, the dotted um, fabric that you see here. Mm. Then I was given an orange piece of fabric by a former violin student of mine, Madevi Gerwitz, who was then 14. My very favorite sweatshirt as a kid was orange with a big blue whale on the front spouting water. I remember being the happiest child on earth wearing that sweater. It was already worn out and ratty by the time my older cousin gave it to me, but it was his favorite thing, so I loved it with all my heart. He was my hero at that time, and I was so proud that he had decided to give it to me instead of his younger sister. I got it when I was very young, probably around two years old. I was growing like crazy at the time, but I insisted on wearing it until I was six, even though I had grown out of it by then. I remember the joy I felt when wearing the sweatshirt. I gave you a sleeve with which I wiped my tears when I was sad, into which I laughed when I was happy or sneezed into when I was sick. <coughs> the next one was given to me by Maria Hassan, who I met in 2016 when she was uh, working, volunteering as a translator in many of the um, refugee shelters in Berlin. This scarf is connected to both of my grandmothers. Both were born in small villages in the north of Iran. My grandmother on my mother's side in 1917 was slaving away knee deep in the waters of rice fields while carrying her newborns on her back. She had her first child at 18 and died when she was 35, bleeding to death with the birth of her eighth or 10th child. My grandmother on my father's side was born in 1910, married with 16, and was a widow with three children at the age of 20. They told me she was beautiful, but she did not remarry for love or wealth. It was her only chance to survive. She lived at a time and a place where tradition, religion, and especially men were ruling over women's life. I will kind of leave that page here, I know that I'm already running short of time, and I hope that you are all fast readers and <laughs> will be able to read all three stories as quickly as you can. This is the concert, or one of the concerts. And these two concert, who or what is coming together? You heard some of the stories that I said, maybe you were able to super quick read three stories now on that page. Um, did you feel that those stories are chaotic? Did you feel that they don't belong to each other? That they don't have a rhythm being put together? But who or what is putting the rhythm together? Who or what is actually keeping it as whole? Whole as being the root of healing. Whole. Not intending to not be sick, not be sad, but to be whole. One of my visual arts project, let's say, these are planetary constellations of specific moments in time. This one is 
2011 before Common Era, 16th of March. The coordinates are the coordinates of one of the sources of the Amazon River. This is what back then, not only human beings, everything was perceiving as something that was radiating, that was shining in the sky. This is the future, 25th of January in 2783, from the perspective of Lalibela. We do not know what's going to be on this planet, on this day, but this image is definitely going to be visible somewhere in the sky. This is 4th of April 1968, the moment when Martin, Martin Luther King was shot. I'm rushing now to my, I think, last project that I want to share and with which I also started the presentation here, the singing project. Um, which I began at the Kunsthalle in Osnabrück and then activated and um, followed developing at the Gropius Bau, where it still is in a way. So if you're interested in not only singing one sound as you did now, but more, uh, you're welcome. Um, the singing project also had a period where it was an exhibition exhibition in the sense of holding space for. So there were several rooms with some of my works, but all of the works were serving kind of as um, invitations to, to maybe hear, perceive, see what else is there. That is, if we do dare to see, to hear it. And, um, and then all the rooms were always open and also free of charge for anyone who wanted or was able to come, to come and to fill the rooms with their sounds. And I want to show you two little examples of how that then sounded. Maybe you actually got the idea. Just imagine how there are a lot of people walking around and there is sound all around them. And it was an interesting experience because there was also frustration. Some people came, and I have to come to an end, and asked the guards, for example, oh, we didn't know that there was a performance. Why is it not announced? We would have come at a different time. And the guards had to say, we actually don't know when it happens. It could happen any time. You might come tomorrow and there's no one here singing, but you might also come back in a week and the room might look like, how do I return to my um, presentation? Thank you. And the room might look like the room on the left side, which looked like that empty on the right side, but <coughs> did sometimes during workshops look like what you see on the left side. And um, I would have loved to show you more, but I hope that you got a flavor of, um, yeah, through which what I showed here so far, and I will close my <laughs> presentation <laughs> at this moment. Um, and follow to speak with the two of you.
Stefan and Ayumi. Thank you so much, Ayumi. Thank you so much, Stefan. Now is the time for questions. Maybe you both take a seat. And I was thinking maybe I actually stay where I am and you sit next to her. And um, so, first, first, first off, uh, thank you so much for these uh, two very inspiring inputs that we received from you um, that um, from very different fields at the same time very much kind of also connected to one another. For you, um, I will start by, say that? Spotlight. I don't have a spotlight anymore. Um, I will start maybe by breaking the ice with a few questions, more general questions, and then also ask you to kind of maybe react to one another. Of kind of you also didn't know what to expect from one another's presentation. And at the same time, get you prepared for your questions. Now this is the moment to ask. I should sit down <laughs> because of the camera. Okay. Um, can you see us actually in the back row when we sit down here? Is this okay? Okay, we were worried about this here. And maybe we start with a very um, basic definition of health, because you both referred to it. Last week, when Christopher Bailey um, gave his talk, he shared with us the WHO definition of health, no? because this is the healing arts. So what actually is health? Um, and the WHO, the World Health Organization, defines this as not uh, merely the absence of disease and infirmity, but the attainment of the highest level of physical, mental, and social well-being. Hence, the value of the arts become very apparent. And Stefan, you earlier showed us this kind of beautiful diagram of the psychosocial aspects, the environment, the healthcare system, and the genes and biology. Um, you just spoke uh, of the wholeness as a kind of a beginning of your understanding of health or healing. So maybe we can both start with a very basic definition from where you both come from of what actually health means. Because I, th I think I said this also the last time, there's more to that. Because it's also very political terrain. What do we consider as being in need of healing or of need of repair? And what are the body politics behind it? So yeah, uh, against this backdrop, what is health to both of you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as you mentioned, the WHO, the World Health Organization, since 30, 40 years, has had a, a very idealistic definition. <laughs> Namely, health is absence of any psychological, physiological, or social disorder. That is totally unrealistic from, no, from a normal yes, medical perspective. Okay. I, I think in, in medicine we are already very satisfied if the patient seems um, overall content with, with his situation. In other words, for example, if he has a chronic disorder but learns how to deal with it, how to accept it or can do it, I think that's already a lot to be gained, um, particularly because we feel nowadays the focus should be much more the patient, him or herself, determining as to what's important for him or her, rather than someone else, for example, a doctor, determining what kind of values should be reached by the patients. Let's take hypertension, you know, here in the room, 20% may have more than 130 millimeter mercury hypertension. So some doctors may tell you you are sick already, although you don't even know that. Others may say hypertension starts only with 140 and so on. So this is also where the, the, the bad pharma industry and their interests come into, into uh, place, of course. So we feel nowadays that the patient himself is much more important in terms of saying, am I content overall with my physiological, psychological situation? Yeah, I, um, I resonate with the term contentment to, to feel whole, maybe, to not feel that something is missing. And what is the definition of that nothing is missing and everything is complete. So none of us, um, and to me this is a, a relational 
term also. So while um, I do also see that it is each one um, as the patient or as the individual, each of those individuals are held by a family structure, by a society. Is this society working as a whole? Is this, fam is this society content? And um, for me, while I do understand that there are very, very severe sicknesses, that we are lucky to have people coming from the medicine who are able and who continue to, to research on how to um, heal those diseases. An equally important question to me is, what is the environment for the disease to, to even be there? And what is the patient or the, f the system, the society disconnected, not content, in order to give room to such sicknesses. And, um, and I'm jumping now to the musical field again. So in traditional Chinese medicine, also in Tibetan medicine, it is understood that, the, that everything is in motion. So every atom that makes each of us is in movement. There is nothing like stillness in the natural world. And if there is somewhere in the body something that is not moving with the whole anymore, this is one of the important roots to look at in order to heal, in order to be whole again, in order for everything to be in movement again. Does it mean to be without pain? Does it mean to be never ever without any sickness? Does it mean to, to not die? No, it doesn't. It might be a part of life, a part of also being healthy, that we are not always well. Maybe then I can jump in um, on this music and vibration aspect. Um, you at the beginning showed us the physical effects of music um, and the, the classical music that you played on the heart rate, on the brain, etc. Um, you kind of gave us an actually real example that we, we, we did it together with you. So music is not just an emotional sensation, eh, but it's a very real physical uh, perception caused by frequencies and vibrations. We agree to that, no? And what are namely frequency transmission even more. So, um, and as you said, just like the brain and cell currents of our body, music also vibrates on certain... Oh my, am I that bad with the sound the whole time? <laughs> Sh should you hear me like this? It's much better, huh? Could you hear me before? Yeah. yeah? Okay? Okay, but now with the full mic. So what I want to say, music also vibrates on certain wavelengths. So I don't know if you kind of have engaged in, on, on this level in your research on music and healing or in your uh, aspect as well. Because that also comes very close to what like contemporary theoretical physics or quantum physics is about. It's very much about kind of a vibrational universe or frequencies and everything is in constant movement and vibration. And, and how far do these kind of thoughts um, interfere also in your practice? Stefan, maybe starting with you. I think it's rather short-sighted to think that the effect is just physics, vibration, and I, I think the important part is the meaning and the emotion that is that uh, is perceived by the by the listener, by the music recipient, and um, and again, I think there is a similarity to medicine because. Uh, it's not only that some drug is developed, uh, is delivered to you or some surgery, but I think the doctor-patient relationship also plays a role. So, in other words, the meaning and the emotion, the interaction between, between healthcare provider and, and patient is important. So, um, in, in that respect, there's a huge subjective uh, factor here. Some, some people, for some, the, the, the same identical music, for some people may be heaven, and for the neighbor may be hell. 
I mean, imagine your neighbor is listening to some music that you like or you strictly dislike. It, it could make a huge difference, although it may be the same music. So therefore, I think it's subjective perception is essential. Yes, everything is subjective. And um, then to your question, Lucas, um, I don't actively pursue healing effects through my work. Not at all. If it resonates back to me, for example, with the singing project, already from the very beginning when it started at the Kunsthalle Osnabrück, there were people who, after a few months of participating, came to me and said, you know, I had heavy migraines for 20 years and I don't have them anymore. I have had tremendous challenges for um, sleeping through or falling asleep. I don't have that anymore. Did this happen because of the project? Did it happen because of the recipient? Did it happen because when we <coughs> sing, for example, we are actively participating we are actively working on maybe um, allowing parts in our bodies that are not in movement with everything else around to become a bit more movable again. Maybe. I don't know. And maybe while you guys think if you have a question for one another, I already get you a little bit triggered. So. Think of a question, we have another one here, but then start to slowly kind of come up with your questions. Yeah? Don't be afraid to ask, no, no shame <laughs> in the game. But having listened, listened to one another, any kind of reflections, questions, remarks that you want to give? Well, your last point that you mentioned, that I, I was quite curious to, to, to hear, do you have any therapeutic implication or not? Because I can imagine many artists do not at all want to have any therapeutic uh, 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 concept. I mean, they, uh, they think art is just the highest form of, of my personal expression. So, and, and I understand you mentioned that, that for you it's, it's the same. Now, of course, in medicine, we, are, uh, we, we look for ways that artists can relate to healing processes and can feel uh, that they contribute to that. I, I think there is a specific empathic therapeutic element that needs to be added to artistry in order to then gain uh, or get therapeutic gain or benefit. Mm. Yes, but as you said, I don't have any interest in engaging actively any um, agencies into towards Therape therapeutic effects. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I try to be very aware and try to learn as much as I can, observe as much as I can of how the works that I create are engaging with myself, with others. So it's first led by my own curiosity. It is the opposite of a personal expression. I try to not be in the way of what is around me and to connect aspects in a way that the connectivity between those aspects becomes um, visible or tangible. But I, not, I don't try to express anything. Um, yes, so, so much to you. I, I feel that if some of the practices I'm very curious and interested in creating more works that are participatory. And again, similarly to the question of what is a concert, who is coming together? Who is participating? Am I, who am I excluding by the practice that I'm creating? And is it possible, how, how wide can I open a practice for as many and not only human beings to participate? And to also ask myself, is a sculpture really a sculpture or a light work by definition that we all have studied in art history in our also artistic practice? Or could 
a light work also be, for example, something like the singing project, because I worked with a, um, in a physicist and who researched that when people sing in a space, the space becomes measurably lighter. So imagine if a lot, a lot, a lot of people sang with each other at the same time, this would actually measurably make the light around us lighter. And I have, of course, personal feelings, personal interpretations on it, but I don't find that these sh need to be part of my um, artworks. This is my personal stuff. I feel more like facilitating these spaces. And then if somebody who is working in the medicinal field is interested in exchanging or also using some of the practices, I'm, for example, in regards to the singing project, also because I was asked by many people from different fields in the process of publishing a book, and the book is more going to be a manual that, um, yeah, that is a collection of uh, practices on how to use the voice that can be done by, by anyone and everywhere. can be done in a museum, in a gallery, in a um, hospital, in schools. Okay, I have a, I have a direct follow-up, but maybe I give you the chance now. So who dares of you guys first? Should we turn off the light so you feel more safe, or? Yes, please. And I will repeat it afterwards again. Yes. Uh, well, I think Kirkland will help with some pain. Where we are, visual from Opaniense will only help the select group. What do you think about the objectives of education and socialization while talking about healing in art and or music? And is healing with art something that has to be always seen with the subjective context of the patient? Well, that's a task to repeat. <laughs> 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 Um, did you get the question? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I. I, uh, I very hope good that question, I got the but question. it was hard because it was such precise uh, terms that you found that to repeat that mm -hmm. properly without kind of. Uh, uh, thank you for the. I think I got two important points, but I believe the, the last one is a clear yes. I think, I think, artistic uh, effectiveness is always based on the subjective setting of whoever receives it. For example, style of music. You know, what kind of music does he like? What kind of art does he like? What kind of dance does he like or she? So, um, and then I think you also refer to the question who has the ability to use art as a resource. Uh, if I don't misunderstand you. And there, of course, we are at a quite select group of population that has been exposed to art in school or whatever or in university and that knows how to use concerts, exhibitions for its pleasure, whereas many people don't have that access because uh, they come from a different socioeconomic layer. And in fact, that is one of the advantages that I feel including art in hospitals. I mean, my, my ba basically, I think hospitals will just be more beautiful if, if there's more art. Think about the radiotherapy unit. But secondly, I think all of a sudden, uh, people that are usually not exposed to culture at all can be exposed to art. Maybe see some picture here or listen to some music. And in fact, I know music therapists that exactly tell me that. They, they say, the patients say, we, we would never have dared or would never have gone to a concert. But if you come to my room, all of a sudden I get curious and I start to understand what, what's going on here. So it, it's a pretty good setting, if you think about it, to, to, make, uh, to, to have art as a resource for much more people, namely for sick people, than in usual daily life. I don't disagree. <laughs> At the same time, I feel that the way how we define what is culture and what is art is extremely arrogant and very, very narrow in um, comparison to what else is there and what else is creation, creative. There is, for example, just as a small um, example, a correlation between the sound of birds singing and plant activity. This has also an effect on 
everything else that is alive and how this life is structured. A Beethoven symphony might be, you said in your quest, I don't know who of the two of you said, he might like Beethoven or not like music or not like Beethoven. The part in a person that likes Beethoven is only a very small part of that person because that person, while it's fantastic if this person enjoys Beethoven, has so many other shades of being a human being that are connected to so much more around. So I'm very, very skeptical about um, the wish of creating more art, making art more accessible. Who are we to make art more accessible to whom? There is also so much art that we don't even know about because they were created by cultures and by people who didn't make it into the history books that most of us were studying, that didn't make it into the Berlin Philharmonic Hall. And my two cents to the question is that I think that this whole question, uh, the whole topic that we're discussing should actually not start here in a university context, um, but actually at very uh, early child education. So um, and I think that's really where it starts, where you get sens sensitized for it. Whatever forms of art, whether they're the unheard of, the unknown, or the, 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 the main ones. Uh, and there's, it's also interesting, in the last couple of years, there's this kind of European educational policy, which is short for STEM, that stands for Stein, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And only since a couple of years, STEM became STEAM, Science, Technology, Arts, and Mathematics. Mm. So there's a slight shift, but if you look at curriculums of, um, let's say, first to six years in school, and that's, I think, the foundational years, even before that, actually, music, art, even sports, they're very secondary let's say, to the other class, also what, what importance it takes. So I think, for me, it really starts there. We are actually too late. <laughs> we came too late to the party, in a way, here. No? So I think it has to start much, much earlier. But thank you for that first question. Another question. Yes, right. One here and one there. Um, yeah, I have actually two, but I will start with one. This is addressing your role as a conductor. And how would the concert Okay, the question was, how would you feel as a conductor if the audience that's there would first and foremost come for their health benefits? <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Uh, <laughs> Correct? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think at the end of the day, everybody that goes to a concert hall wants to feel better afterwards. So uh, he goes there for a by a large health effect, not, not by a specific treatment effect, by some general quality of life health effect. Otherwise, you would not torture yourself, go to a concert that you know you will dislike. So therefore, to me, that's not a contradiction. Of course, it is always nice to know that the percentage of people that do not fall asleep during the concert is rather high. So <laughs> falling asleep means that there is little going on between performer and audience. And that is usually then boring. But, but again, I would, not, I would not expect or hope for specific health effects. It could also be a cause of like deep relaxation <laughs> if someone deep falls asleep. Relaxation, no. Deep relaxation, deep sleep. But you had a second question there as well. Say that again. So you um, used No, 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 no. That was the definition of the World Health Organization that I find totally unrealistic. The World Health Organization said everybody should be totally free of social, psychological, and physiological problems. That is, in normal medical life, that's totally un unrealistic. I said I am happy if the patient is content with his situation, if he comes to terms 
because he knows how to how to live his life and uh, in in a way that yeah he's he's uh, uh, how did you you had a nice expression how how to feel whole, whole. Yeah. I, I think that's that's a good expression how to feel I would say content you would say whole then I'm I'm very happy I think that's already a, that's the essential point. Even if the values, the objective values, not quite match what someone else tells you, you, sh you, you should weigh that and have this kind of pressure and that kind of blood value in order to be healthy. I think that that's, can be pretty artificial and technical. And then you had a question. Yeah, at the beginning, you were defining, you were healing, but because you were relating to those values, you That's very beautiful. I repeat it for, uh, by the way, 88 people online. It's, um, <laughs> we started, as you said, with a definition of the term healing, both of you. Um, but um, you mentioned also the grass growing and the birds singing, etc. Now the question is, what is your definition of what art actually is? One um, expression that I like is, time is art. Time is art, when we can perceive the art artistry of what time actually is, only because the, there is time are we able to experience this. And then if I apply this to what is art, maybe art is what allows us to, to experience something that is whole, even though this whole is actually quite Infinite. How about you, uh, To me, art is is very basic. It's if when something is created, either painting, sculpture, or literature, music, whatever, that starts to have a certain meaning for the recipient, so that causes some communication. I think that's when, for me, art starts. It's a, it's a process of communication. And I have to confess, it's also associated with, with some kind of beauty or, or pleasure. So I usually hate, for example, dry art that, that I find appalled by, like dry composition, serial music from, from the 50s of the last century. I, I, I find that appalling. And then I... I, I don't like that art, but that's my personal issue. That I also require some kind of beauty or pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions, by the way. Um, and there's another one, please. one. Thank you for that question. Okay, for the psychologists in the back row, this is for you guys. So, um, the question was coming to your definition of health, like being whole or being content, but what if scenario this patient is schizophrenic? Is uh, schizophrenic, for example, yeah, yeah. is like whatever, it has a mental disorder that kind of that she or her, him or they imagine themselves to be in a fantasized world and being actually very content and whole in that one. Yeah. So what, we do, <laughs> what do we do? It's like a... Well, the, the essential problem always starts if you start harming other people or yourself. That is when the alarm light in doctors flash. Uh, as long as you don't harm yourself or others, you can be as schizophrenic as you want to if you are happy. But, but if you start to harm your neighbor because you, th you, you think you're sent by Jesus to kill him or whatever, or if you... If you harm yourself because you, I don't know, you want to jump out of the window because you think it's funny or you, uh, then, then as a doctor you have, to, you have to act because that is our duty to save life. Ayumi, do you want to add? 
Yes, I was once told by a psychologist that there are actually no crazy people. There is only a crazy world um, that is not um, like fit to um, to hold everything, let's say. And um, while I agree, of course, with you, Stefan, that um, if someone tries to hurt others or oneself, that hopefully there are people around who can help this person. But um, at the same time, um, I would also love to see more research in, um, in, in systemic approaches that there is no, there is never just one solo person acting out all on its own. There are always many, many factors that come together to even allow a person to become very destructive. And those aspects have to be equally hold, healed, as the patient, as the person. Oh, yeah. Um, my dear um, online audience, um, do you have any questions? You can be heard. And I see, uh, yes, a hand raising two more, okay. But uh, online, the 80, 88 online, any questions from you guys? No. Then, uh, last row, and then... The yeah, I think you have to actually speak up even louder all the way back there. Um, no, I just wanted to know if that was a fun fact, like an ironic story that you wanted to share with us, or if there was actually some research made on that, um, that could uh, like connect the deaths to the fact that they were on stage performing. If there is any correlation, or if it was just like... Um, Open question. And so can I add to this question also as a um, sort of double let question to you? Let me repeat you. this ah, first, the question. So I don't know if you heard it, but yeah. the question was regarding the, the conductors who died on stage performing, right. what was it mm -hmm. in particular? Um, it was not Tristan and Isolde. Tristan and Isolde, <laughs> yeah. And Mahler. Um, whether this had a correlation or was more like an open question or a kind of, a, a kind of bit of an ironic take, or is there... A, do you see any correlations from a medical okay. point of per perspective? So that said, you wanted to add and something to the And I would love to, to add something that there are many, many cultures that actually experience death as a very blissful moment. And yeah. all these conductors must have perceived music as very blissful because otherwise they would have chosen another job. So, Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think it's probably one of the nicest deaths you could imagine. Um, well, there's, there's many many ug ugly and painful ways to die. So, plus, uh, a little more on the serious side, I mean, conductors are known to have pretty good longevity. So, so however, emotional, acute emotional stress can contribute particularly to cardiac death. It is known that people that have cardiac disease, if they experience acute stress, for example, if your long-term life partner dies in elderly couples, it is well known that the surviving partner has a much higher increase uh, rate of, of cardiac death than during, at least during the next couple of months. A actually, to be, to be more specific, it's only the men that have a higher a higher increase of cardiac death. Women, when their partner dies, do not have an increased risk of cardiac death. So, so that is subject to your interpretation why that is the case. But, but again, emotional upset can be a trigger of sudden cardiac death. That is for sure. And that is certainly also what happens to these conductors. So maybe two more questions before I come to my final one. Jakob, there was uh, someone who, who had the, was it you? Yeah. I think this question has been here for, for a time, online question. Ah, okay, yeah. good, then an online uh, question, then I see you. Uh, Ventao Feng, uh, Ven Feng, could you ask your question? You can speak and we should be able to hear you. 
We don't see, we just hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, so loud and clear. Uh, yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, how, do you try, uh, how, how do you choose the right type of music for your patient in your music uh, therapy practice? Uh, like pop, classic, and uh, rock, and, and what kind of music, like symphony, chamber music, uh, and solo, something like that. And you mentioned the uh, Mozart effect. So uh, is that classical music is the most common choice? So how do we find, thank you so much for your question. Uh, how do you find music therapy? I mean, that's not for you to answer really, actually. But the right type of music, classical, orchestra, solo, pop. That is an open question in, in medical research. I mean. There have been both approaches. There have been standardized pieces of music delivered to certain patients. Uh, and there has been a more subjective approach that you would ask the patient, what, is, what music do you, do, you, uh, do you like? What do you like best? What, what music do you wish for us to play? So I think, I, I personally think the subjective uh, um, factor plays an important role. You, you need to, to give art that the patient likes. Otherwise, I would guess that the effect is, uh, is, is much less pronounced. But, but again, that is something that hopefully will be studied in more detail in, in research. Okay, so looking at the time, I have one more question. I have also two in the audience. Uh, and then one here. Uh, no, okay, so we'll, we'll wrap it up quickly. So first, uh, the lady in the red sweater. Oh, that's a wonderful and big question. What, why are you doing what you're doing? This just goes for both of them, no? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I love that question. It's actually one that I had another series of talks I always ask uh, the participants as well. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that um, question. I, I often ask um, myself, why? And, um, and then the answer is, is always that, um, and maybe this would also be a definition of, of art for me, at least, um, because I'm curious. I am curious. I want to, I'm curious in, in walking both physically and in my mind into directions that I have not been before. And um, cr shaping this into a practice so it can be shared with others and to, out of curiosity, see what this does. And then, you had another question? Uh, but yeah. Stefan also. Yeah. Oh, so, 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 I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I totally jumped over you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, I, I used to, until 10, 15 years, I used to separate mu music and medicine strictly. Music, uh, medicine was my job, music my leisure activity. But then I, I think in medicine I experienced a lot of things that I found need to be improved. For example, Many hospitals are really ugly. If you go to hospitals, you will be surprised how just ugly they are. A basic level of beauty which can be so important. It, as long as you have a quick disease, and in and out, it doesn't really affect you. But for example, there's a colleague of mine here in the room. She uh, works in, in cardiac surgery with very young with children, some, some of them spent months or even years in the hospitals because of complicated cardiac disorders. So, so they deserve to have a, a beautiful environment already. Le just not even referring to healing or not, but just something which is nice, which is not ugly. So plus, as a researcher, I'm curious, and, when, and I showed you several studies where the effect, the additional effect of art therapy is very obvious in addition to usual medical therapy. So if that such effect is proven, I think we need to deliver that to the patient. That's our obligation to deliver best possible care. However, I also mentioned that many aspects are not 
clear yet. So it's too early to just see everything through uh, uh, beautiful eyeglasses and say art should be there and will help. I'm, I, I'm, it's always good to be skeptical and say first you have to show it in, in solid research that it really adds something for the patient. <coughs> I know, but um, first you, and then the online question. Um, my question is a bit uh, outside the scope of this, but it relates. Um, it's to do with art and politics, um, or art and religious political practice. So this, this, um, how art relates to myth making, to propagating belief. Um, classical music has been used in LA metro stations. And it has been proven to reduce uh, homelessness, for example, so playing on the psychological aspect. And I've seen an English show at Gopi's uh, Bow, which to me felt like a religious sermon. So that, uh, this singing together in this big hall really felt like a, yeah, almost like a, um, I forgot the name, but when you go to church, you have a choir. Um, so for me, the question is, do you see um, research into art and it's like how to mold psychology through art as having potentially detrimental effects in pacifying uh, <coughs> societies or otherwise guiding them through more effective propaganda. Yes. Ooh. Um, so, uh, what are the, it's in, in, in a nutshell, so kind of, does, mm -hmm. does uh, the, the use of art um, have also, can it be used in propaganda? ways, whether it's creating kind of a spiritual ceremony like uh, um, mm -hmm. atmosphere or guiding people in a certain direction. Mm. Yes, a lot and including arts can be used as, uh, as a tool to propagate um, specific ideas and it has been done so music has very often used to make people march into war. Um, music is also being used to make people feel very, very proud of their national identity. Music is being used to confirm with large groups of people that the general mood should be grief or joy. Or, and it can be very, very manipulative and myth building. Um, and at the same time, it's not only art that is that can be used as a manipulative tool, also education, and the way I perceive it, also the medicinal system can be used <laughs> to manipulate into making someone feel sick. Maybe they aren't sick if, this is, if, if the gaze was different. So I see that there is a huge responsibility in not only um, being very clear with one's own intention on why am I doing what I'm doing, but also to point out um, the, effect, the, manip the manipulative effects when we, obs when we see them, when they become visible to us. And, um, and for this also to, to work with, to work interdisciplinary, to work with scientists, to work with, um, with people who, who can bring their, each their own perspectives together in order to even more clearly um, unmantle structures that are only um, benefiting to a few. Do you want to add anything? No, I, I fully agree. Absolutely agree with yeah. what you said. Mm. Actually, yes, I think of uh, a couple of months ago, I was actually in the Philharmonie and I heard a Chostakovich concert, which is absolutely amazing, but super politicized, if you want to research into the the composer. But on the other hand, as a counter question, it's also interesting, this kind of, yes, this can be used, but also name one um, dictatorship that has a um, freedom of the arts. Zero. Because the arts can also be highly disruptive and highly, highly <coughs> dangerous. No? So yes, it's being used, but uh, freedom of arts in any kind of suppressive regime does not exist because of the power, the inherent power of the arts. So, actually, guys, I'm amazed. It's 8 o'clock. It's been a long time. You're still here, and there's still questions coming up. So, there's one online question. You can call Mo. Mo, <laughs> please. This is your moment. Hello, Benedict. Yes. So, it's coming back to the point of like, which music could have a certain effect and effect. It's very good to share, by the way. 
mm -hmm. and you came up with a point that is not subjective. But also, what do you think? Like, is the research that if it's more about frequencies going to kind of compensation, or is it more like the whole appearance of music piece, like let's say a whole band and some singer in a classical setup or whatever? Yeah. So more precise to the question of music used, is there any research done on like certain frequencies that maybe on a certain wavelengths have a better effect, or is it indeed subjective? Do you know if there's any kind of research being done on that? I would like to um, only share one research that I did personally together with researchers, which is what I mentioned earlier, that um, when people sing in space, the light becomes measurably lighter. When we put up an MP3 uh, sound in space, that doesn't happen. Mm. It doesn't happen with any recording, recorded music that we know of. It only happens when, when people are actually creating the music in the moment. Mm. But I would be very curious to, if you know of. I mean, I, I know there is research going on, but I'm, 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 I'm I simply don't know the details. There's many research groups now that look at what kind of music, what kind of frequencies, what kind of noise, yes or no, evoke what kind of nervous and emotional response. Mm. For example, also using these images of, of the brain that I showed you as an example. So I think there's, uh, there's a lot to be learned. I don't think there is too much knowledge yet, but there's a lot of ongoing research. Wonderful. And maybe now, I think there's even more questions, but we have to come to an end. Um, and also for you, the online audience, there's also hands raising here, but it's already eight. Um, I would like to close with one kind of final question. It's probably going to be a question that I'm going to ask each of our guests here. Um, my attempt here is kind of to bring the Wissenschaft and the Wissenkunst together. Um, so the, the, the art or of the knowledge of the sciences and the knowledge of the arts. You are kind of are trained in both. You have been trained in the, the arts, in the music. You have kind of worked as a director of a music school. You're also a medical practitioner. You are a violinist, but as you just said, there's been collaborations with scientists as well, or you're very interested in this. Where, in a very short maybe reply, do you see the differences and the possibilities that lie in between Wissenschaft and Wissenkunst? So I, I do regard them as autonomous but complementary kind of epistemological systems, kind of ways of, for us to understanding the reality that we live in. Where do you see where do you see the openings, the possibilities? And what have you learned? What of the artist kind of thinking methodology has entered your medical practice and vice versa? For me, it's relatively easy to answer because what the examples you showed of your own artistic work, I found surprisingly similar to how we would act in medicine. In other words, when you, for example, have a performance and try to find the different connections. Try to see what my music, my clothes, my movements, where is the connection? Uh, that is exactly what in medicine doctors would usually try to find. First of all, on a very basic level, they would look for different symptoms and try to put things together. But then in a, in a, in a doctor-patient relationship, they would, they would try to, to give meaning to whatever is there, disease-related. So in that respect, I, I found surprising similarity, actually, between your work and the work of a, of a doctor. Mm. And I would give a very similar answer that um, I'm, I'm most of the time really enjoying to, um, to discuss, to, to share perspectives interdisciplinary, especially with, uh, with scientists. And um, also because very often I, and I think you, Lucas, mentioned it already, um, I see that um, actually the, the approach is oftentimes very similar. And then it's different fields that we work in and we can support each other in understanding more about it. But um, yeah, there are, I see so much similarities. Wonderful. 
So that said, I would like to thank you all. And actually, let's start by applause for our wonderful guests here. No? First of all, thank you for Stefan Willich and Ayumi Paul. Thank you for all of you that joined us online and that are here and stayed all the way till five past eight. Thank you for the questions. Sorry if your question wasn't heard today, but then maybe next time. And uh, we will meet as the Healing Arts in two weeks from now again. And uh, we'll, uh, there will be Benno Brinkhaus, who was actually sitting here in the first row from the Charité in Edna Bonhomme. That said, be safe, be well, and see you soon. Have a wonderful Monday evening.